And thank you to the strings. That was beautiful this morning. I want to welcome you to Pioneer Memorial Church. Special welcome to our preview guests. We have some of you in our audience today. We are excited that you are looking at Andrews as a possibility to go to school. So a special welcome to you. Also to those watching online or listening, we are glad you're here as well. Now this morning, we have a few announcements from Pioneer Life. The first one is Women's Ministries is having a special event on Sunday, April 28th. Robin Tate is presenting on stress and hope in the teen loft. So if you want more information, you can check the website for that. And we also have a very special celebration announcement. Our Pathfinders, we had three PBE teams. Does anyone know what PBE is? Oh, okay, then I have opportunity to let you know. It's called Pathfinder Bible Experience. And in this, teams across all of our area and then our state, and then it goes all the way to North America. And, and one of our teams made it to the last, the fourth, the final competition. They get to memorize huge, yeah, you can give them a round of applause. They have memorized huge portions of scripture and competed against all Pathfinder clubs across North America. So I'm gonna invite Errol Prentice, our director, up to say a few things. All right, all right thank you very much, uh, Pastor Lindsay. Uh, this year, the uh, Evergreens uh, PBE participants were composed of three teams. So we had three teams. Uh, two teams reached the uh, conference level and one team, which is the Juniper team, as you can see at the front, is going to be going to uh, Colorado for the division level. And that's going to happen on the uh, 19th and 20th of um, April. Uh, PBE follows the uh, Pathfinder year. Uh, this year was a study based on the book of uh, Joshua and Judges. Um, there are two books were divided amongst the six-person team, and each scholar studies about six chapters. The number of verses memorized were close to about 165 verses. We met about uh, three times per week during the school week. Then we met almost every day during the Christmas break and the spring break. We met as a group and logged approximately 300 hours during practice. And during these, um, we tested these scholars with about 4,000 questions. We have three staff members, uh, Mrs. Logan, uh, Larry Shock, and uh, Joel, who's our leaders. And um, I also want to let you know that uh, this would not be possible without the uh, help of the parents. Uh, the parents had to be behind the, um, the Pathfinders so that we can have a successful uh, PBE program. Uh, now we are moving to the division level. I just want to ask the church to continue praying for us as we move again to the uh, division level and hope that we are successful there um, in the next week. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you, Pathfinders. And you can see them tomorrow at the International Food Fair. Buy some corn dogs for lunch uh, there tomorrow to help us raise money for the Camp Free because we're going there soon. Thank you, Pathfinders. Now I invite you to turn your attention to our call to worship found on the screen or in your bulletin. And please read along with me. Look to God whose might upholds us, whose strength heals us. Our eyes will see him, our ears will hear his voice. See, Christ is the faithful witness. He directs us to God who is the source of our lives and the provider of our hopes. Please stand with me as we have opening prayer. Heavenly Father, God, we've come to worship you this morning, this afternoon. God, I pray your Holy Spirit continue to rest upon each of us on our hearts. God, I pray for Pastor Shane as he brings the word um, from your word. God, be with us here. Um, take our worship. 
In your name, amen.
morning and happy Sabbath, church family. I want to invite you to come down here to the altar of God and just lay down all your burdens on him. And as we sing our next song, Tis So Sweet, let's just realize and think about how sweet it is to just trust in Jesus and rest upon his promises. Please join us in singing.
Father in heaven, we are grateful for your power, your graceful power, your gentleness, your forgiveness. Father, we have seen your power in nature and we see your power in our fellow humans. We ask that you'd please, Father, be with the people that are struggling in health right now. We, we think specifically of Lana Chapman and all over campus. We have people that are in need of strength and healing, people that are struggling with the loss of loved ones. I just pray, Father, that uh, you would guide them. You would give them the strength and courage that they need. Father, in Galatians 6, you give us a directive to bear or carry the burdens of others. And we are doing that now. We want to pray for the individuals in our hearts that aren't on lists openly, ones that are in our secret prayers. And Father, we also want to lift up those that are sin sick. Because in that directive, you didn't say it's just for health reasons that we pray or lift up. But Father, we know the different sins that you pointed out in Galatians 5 that would prevent us, Father, from being with you. But we need to carry those burdens with them. And we are thankful that you have given us that, although we don't want, we don't want to hold those burdens as our own. We want to straighten them out and fix them. But Father, help us to be gentle and kind like you also said in, in Galatians 5 that uh, the fruits of the Spirit are love and joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, self-control. Even though somebody may be angry or have hurt us in some way, those burdens are ours. And so Father, we spend a moment now praying for those that have health problems, both physically, mentally, emotionally, and Father, especially spiritually. So right now, let's take a moment and think of those that are on our minds. Father, thank you for teaching us to pray. We've done this since childhood and we've memorized it well. You taught us how to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now is our time for offering collection. So I want to invite our kids. Actually, it's children's story as well. So all the kids, your time to collect that money that goes for Christian education. They're going to have a church that's going to come on out here. So you can get up and you can start collecting all those dollars to put in the church. I also want to invite our ushers to please stand and bring the plates. We'll have a prayer for that as well. Any loose offering that goes in the plate today goes for the Hope Channel. Anything else you want sent to a specific place, please mark it on your tithe envelope, which is found in the back of your pew. You can set it in there as well. Um, 
Now we'll have, I think we have our, we've got some standing here, there we go, have our word of prayer for, um, and then the kids can go, word of prayer for the money. Heavenly Father, God, thank you. We have opportunity to give back to you. You blessed us with so much. And Father, this is just a piece of what we want to give back. So God, take these monies, use them in all different ministries to bring people closer to you and to know you, God. So multiply it. Thank you. In your name I pray. Amen.
Good morning, children. Wasn't that fun to hear that music? Yes? I saw most of you turning around and listening. Well, today for children's story, I want to tell about a big word. This big word that we're going to talk about today is diversity. Diversity. Do any of you know what diversity might mean? Eh, some do. Okay. Well, we're going to try and teach everybody here what diversity is because they talk about it a lot here at Pioneer and about Andrews. And I wrote some things down here that I could discuss with you about diversity. Number one, there's 195 countries in the world. 92 of them are represented right here in Berrien Springs. Wow. So what makes this so different? What is it? Let's talk about everybody here probably has a different name, right? Shout out some of your names. Real loud. What's your name? What's your name? Caleb. All right. What else have we got? Caleb. Caleb. All right. Many names. You've all got different names, right? So we're very different with that. What's your name? Ilana. Ilana. Okay. We got different hair color. What's some hair color we got over here? What's your hair color? Yeah, sure. Black, okay. What's yours? Brown. Brown. What's yours? Peach, okay. All right. What's yours? Dark brown. Look at all these different colors that we have with just hair color, right? And what have you got for eye colors? What are your eye colors? I see some blue. I see some brown. It's really cool, isn't it? What's your? Dark brown. All right. Wow, that's pretty cool. Now, some of us are boys, some are girls, right? And are you all the same age? You're all born on the same day? No. no, we're all different, aren't we? Let's see. What's your favorite fruit? What's your favorite fruit? Apples. And grapes. Grapes. Pomegranate. Pomegranate. Mangoes. Wow. What's your favorite fruit? Blueberries. Blueberries. Oh, blackberries. I'm sorry. What's yours? Strawberries. Oh, man, there's so many, right? We all like different ones. Um, you've got different favorite foods. How many, let's go with, how many were born in a big family? Lots of kids. Yeah. And what about small families? Some of us were born in small families. What about how many here can speak a different language than English. Look at that. Woo! All right. How many here are left-handed? How many here are right-handed? There's differences, aren't there? How many like dogs? How many like cats? How many like both? Yeah, see? There's all kinds of stuff there, right? Well, we're going to talk a little bit, but I was wondering, how is it that God can look at each one of us and he says, we're all the same? That's puzzling, isn't it? Because we're not all the same. We're very, very different. And just looking at this group up here is very, very different. But I think, I think I've found the illustration that makes this happen, okay? So I'm going to open, this box says Pandora. I'm going to open it. That's for the adults. They have to pay attention to. Okay. All right, and I've got something in here. Does anybody know what these are? Oh, they all know what these are, right? Oh, M&Ms, okay. What colors have we got in here? What colors? What color? Green. You could say it in your own language, too. Red. Maybe you'd say jolty or who knows what you'd see. Orange, right? Yeah. Oh, you like, I, I'll bet you all like M&M's. They come in different sizes. I have some here, some small ones now. They're all in different sizes and colors, aren't they? Well, but there's one thing I want to show you. I'm going to get this out now. That when we look at M&M's, they're so colorful on the outside. But what's on the inside? So I took these apart the other day. And I'll kind of see if I can. 
there, different colors. They've been knocked apart and stuff. But I took first a brown one. I took a brown one, right? And I cut it apart. What's inside? What color? It's brown inside, right? So brown on the outside, brown on the inside. So therefore, if I take a blue one, it'll be blue on the outside and blue on the inside. Is that correct? No, what color is it? It's brown on the inside. What about orange? Maybe it'll be orange on the inside. It's brown. Are they all that way? I think I begin to understand now how God sees us, right? What does it say? Does, what does God say? He looks at the heart, right? What's inside of you. And so to God, we're all like these. Inside, we're all the same to him, right? Even though you're so diverse and you have so many different colors and so many different traits and everything, Inside is what God looks at, and we're all the same. All right. Who would like to pray for me today? Okay. What's your name? Huh? Nicole. Nicole? Okay. You can pray about our differences, and thank you, God, for looking inside, right? Okay. Dear Jesus, thank you for this wonderful Sabbath day. Thank you for taking care of us, and... We thank you, Lord, that we'll have a good Sabbath day and spending time with you. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You can go back to your seats now. Happy Sabbath once again, church family. Please stand as we sing Mighty to Save.
Our scripture reading today is found in Psalms 35, 19 to 25, and it reads, Do not let those glow over me who are my enemies without cause. Do not let those who hate me without reason maliciously wink the eye. They do not speak peaceably, but devise false accusations against those who live quietly in the land. They sneer at me and say, aha, aha, with our own eyes, we have seen it. Lord, you have seen this. Do not be silent. Do not be far from me, Lord. Awake and rise to my defense. Contend for me, my God and Lord. Vindicate me in your righteousness, Lord my God. Do not let them gloat over me.
After all that good music, a wiser man would just sit down and have the benediction. But I'm not a wiser man, and I am going to preach. Uh, my great thanks to uh, Director Elsie and the Orion Strings. Thank you for leading us in worship. Many thanks to Elizabeth and her whole crew, uh, praise team up. Didn't they do wonderfully? Uh, just very, very well done. Thank you. Thank you very much. For and, and as always, uh, Dr. Logan is on the organ and always does a marvelous job here as well. <laughs> Welcome to part two of our continuing series entitled, Why We Are Here. If you weren't here last week, let me catch you up to speed very quickly. Last week we began with the million dollar question. And if you were here, you remember the, the, the imaginary millionaire with the briefcase offering you one million dollars if you could correctly answer the question, what is the mission of the Seventh-day Adventist Church? And I, I shared how when I've asked that question in you know, small groups or larger groups of, of Adventists, uh, many answers are given, often they do not agree with one another. Finally, someone will say, uh, our mission is to fulfill the great commission of Matthew 28, 18 to 20, to make disciples, etc., etc. And indeed, that is a, a very important part of our mission. We are a Christian Christ-centered organization, and so we are about fulfilling the great commission of Matthew 28, 18 to 20. And... There is more. There is still more. And I didn't tell you what that still more was last week because we needed to do a, lay a little bit of a foundation. We needed to be able to understand what it means to be a prophetic movement. And to do that, we looked at the Bible. We looked at three lessons of what it means to be a prophet and by extension, what it means to be a prophetic movement. The three lessons were, number one, prophets are to say and do what God commands them to say and do. This is not up to a committee. You don't have a coin toss at the beginning of each year. God decides what the prophet will say and what the prophetic movement will say. Number two, God often commands prophets to say and do strange things. And we looked at a number of examples of that. And number three, prophets say and do strange things because God is trying to rescue people from disaster. Amen? I mean, this, this is not, it's not a hobby for God. He's not looking for something entertaining to do at the end of time. He does these things to get people's attention that they will be saved, that they will be ready when Jesus comes back. And with that as a foundation, let's get to it. What is the mission of the Seventh-day Adventist Church? Well, the answer is, the mission of the Seventh-day Adventist Church is indeed to make mature disciples of Christ and while fulfilling the Great Commission of Matthew 28, we take it one final step further. Turn in your Bibles, please, to Revelation chapter 14, verse 6. Revelation chapter 14, verse 6, is on, it's on page 830 in your red pew Bible. should be sitting around there somewhere around you. Page 830, Revelation chapter 14, verse 6. Now, I mentioned in part one, and I'm going to mention it again here, and I may have to do it again in some future parts. In this series, because of time constraints, I'm going to be cutting some corners every now and then. I'm about to do that right now. If you're a guest with us today, we are so glad that you're here. You're in for a real treat. If I say something and you're wondering to yourself, how did he possibly get there from here? Come and see me afterwards. I'll be somewhere down here in the front. And, and I'd love to have some time to answer your questions on this very, very important topic. So I'm going to cut a corner right now. The one final step further that the Seventh-day Adventist Church takes beyond the Great Commission is the three angels' messages of Revelation 14, 6 to 12. Amen. <laughs> well, you're doing better than first service did. We had to struggle for one or two. They were still scratching their heads a little bit. Yes, this is true. The one final step further that we take beyond the Great Commission of Matthew 28 is indeed the three angels' messages of Revelation 14, 6 to 12. Now, here's where I'm going to cut a corner. I do not have time to tell you the history of this. I will say that this, this is the nose on the end of the Adventist face. This is absolutely core to who we are. In fact, it is no lie whatsoever to say, from a missiological perspective, if you take the three angels' messages away from the Seventh-day Adventist church, Adventism crumbles. That's the absolute truth. 
Now, I, a whole bunch of people don't know this. There's Adventists you know, right now scratching their head. Well, how could that be? I mean, we've got all these other good things. And blah, 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 blah. Ladies and gentlemen, this is absolutely true. In the beginning of the Adventist church, when we were beginning to be started, we, the, out of the great disappointment until the time when the 1863, when the official name was adopted, God took us on a very specific and intentional journey. And indeed, the three angels' messages are our specific reason for being, period. And if we don't do that, well, we may be doing some good things, but we're not being what God called us to be. These things, this is absolutely indispensable, the three angels' messages to who we are as Seventh-day Adventists. So what are they? What are the three angels' messages? Now, now I don't mean like, like what are the words that are, anybody can read them. They've been in the Bible for quite some time. Revelation 14, 6 to 12, they're all right there. You can read them. What do they mean? Now, we're all okay, but I've heard that there are some Adventists in other places that don't know the answer to that question. They're not sure what these three angels' messages mean. Okay. So I want us to take some time here to unpack what these things are and, and, and what they mean and to understand. We're going to start with the first angel here in just a moment. And, and to understand the first angel, the second angel, the third angel, we need to start with some context. Now, that's just good Bible study, no matter what portion of Scripture that you're studying. Start with some context. May you understand the context of the verses that you are studying. So, what's the context of the three angels' messages? Well, as it turns out, number one, the three angels and their messages are the focus of the book of Revelation. They are the focus of the book of Revelation. Now, some of you are doing the math in your head, like, oh, no, wait a second, there's 22 chapters in the book of Revelation. This is, this is Revelation 14. That's, that's, not, that's not the middle of it. I mean, this is really the focus. The reason why we can say and make a very good argument that indeed the three angels' messages are the focus for the book of Revelation is because of something called chiastic structure. Now, I know what most of you were thinking this morning when you woke up. You, your eyes opened and you said, oh, I hope today he's going to talk about chiastic structure. <laughs> well, good news. This is your lucky day because we're going to do that just for a few moments here. Now, chiastic structure. To get an understanding of what chiastic structure is, you first need to know that chiastic, chiastic structure is, is, is a, a, a way of expression that is very often used in Jewish apocalyptic writing. The book of Revelation, while it's written in Greek, and you might say, well, that's written to a Western audience. No, no, no. The audience was primarily steeped in Jewish apocalyptic thought. And so chiastic structure was something that did not need to be explained to them. They expected it, and indeed, Revelation delivers. So, so what is it? Well, if you are a Western thinker, and you are reading a novel... I'm sure it's a Bible-based novel, and it's very healthy and, and, and uplifting and all of that. So you're reading this novel. If you want to know the punchline, where do you turn in the novel? Which chapter? The last one. That's right, because that, that's how we Westerners think. You know, A, B, A plus B equals C. Boom, we're there. We're at the end, and so we flip to the end, you know, cut to the chase, that kind of thing. Because we put the emphasis at the end. Not so with Jewish Apocalyptic, not so with chiastic structure. Chiastic structure puts the point in the middle. So picture a ladder leaning up against a mirror, okay? And, and it's got three steps on it, A, B, and C. And then in the mirror, you can see the reflection C, B, and A. To help the emphasis... Chiastic structure points people to the middle. So A might have some themes here, and then B would have some themes here, and that leads to this point in the middle of the story of, of what's being told here, what's being described, and then you go C, B, A. Well, isn't that interesting? If you take thematically the book of Revelation, guess what's in the middle? The three angels' messages of Revelation 14, 6 to 12. Ladies and gentlemen, in other words, the primary reason that the book of Revelation was written was the three angels' messages of Revelation 14, 6 to 12. People will look at Seventh-day Adventists and say, you guys just made this stuff up. No, we didn't. God did. God put it here in the middle. And, and the Jewish readers, they would have been thinking, that, okay, we get it. Okay, that's it. All right, we see these other themes. There's these sevens on either sides, etc. things that are repeated. In the middle is these, are these three angels' messages. Context point number two. The three angels' messages are to be given just prior to the second coming of Christ. They are at the end of time. You see, if we were to continue reading in, in chapter 14, verses 14 through 16, we would find there the harvest of the earth. 
In other words, these three angels' messages, what they have to say, what God is saying through them, or whoever it is that is the mouthpiece for those three angels, it is of eternal importance. It is literally a life and death matter. What someone does with the content of the three angels' messages will quite literally determine their destiny forever. So, so this is not a sideshow. This is not a little dark corner of Scripture that should just kind of be brushed over. Maybe every now and then you dust it off. No, 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 no. At this time in history, this is front and center. It's almost like God needed to create an end-time movement to emphasize his end-time message. So we cannot afford to take these things lightly. And with that said, what are they? Revelation 14 beginning with verse 6, the first angel. John here is speaking, he's receiving this vision here. He says, Then I saw another angel flying in midair, and he had the eternal gospel to proclaim to those who live on the earth, to every nation, tribe, language, and people. Pause right there, please. This is a global message. It's not just to be here in Berrien Springs, not to be in St. Joe or Benton Harbor, and just only it is to go all the world. There is no one that you have ever laid eyes on that should not hear the three angels' messages. This is for everyone. It, it, God is saying this is for the world, no exceptions, all the time, everyone. And notice what the message is supposed to be. It's said there at the beginning, and he had the eternal what? Gospel. What does gospel mean? Good news. That's right. I mean, literally, it, 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 when you translate the Greek there, you could just say good news, right? And so this word gospel can, became a technical term to describe the good news of salvation in Jesus Christ. It is good news. And notice, it's not just any good news. It is eternal good news. You can't stop it. It just is going to go. It's like the Energizer Bunny, for those of you that are my age and older, of gospel messages. It keeps going and going and going and going. Eternal good news. So notice carefully what that means. Whatever the first angel's message is, it must be understood as good news. And guess what? If I read it and I think differently, if I think it's bad news, guess who has the privilege of changing their opinion, me or God? I know, tough choice. I know. That's right. Okay, I'm going to go with God. I'm going to say that God is right, okay? And I'm wrong. I'm the one that's going to have to change my opinion on this, and maybe you will be too. So let's see what this incredible, everlasting good news is. Verse 7. He said in a loud voice, no secrets here, Fear God and give him glory, because the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. And right now, I need to introduce you to my next-door neighbor, Bob. Now, Bob is your next-door neighbor, too. Bob is in his 20s, 30s, and 40s. Uh, he's not much of a religious person. He's kind of open to spiritual stuff, you know, every now and then he'll watch something on TV, but not a real Bible study or whatnot. And I have just been studying my Bible, and I've learned the good news of the first angel's message, and I'm going to go share the good news now with Bob. Are you ready? <clears throat> Bob! Bob, it's me, Shane, your next-door neighbor. Bob? Yeah, Bob, it's me. That, no, I, I live next door. Yeah, I know we hardly ever talk, but I, I've got something really good for you, all right? Okay, let, and Bob, being a nice guy, lets me in. Right, hey, Bob, listen, uh, I've been studying my Bible. Do you have a Bible? No? I I'll get you one, all right? So listen, I've been studying my Bible, and as it turns out, at the end of time, that's like when we're right living right now, Bob, uh, there's three messages that God wants everybody to know about, and I've just read the first one. It is such good news, you're going to like this. Do you want to hear it? And Bob, yeah, I, I'd like to hear it. Bob, listen, the, the good news that God wants to share with you is this. You ready? Be afraid, because God's going to judge you. Now, do you want to come to church with me this week or next? <laughs> and Bob's not sure if he ever wants to go to church with me, all right? He's realizing now he's kind of been enjoying the low contact level we've been having over the last decade, right? Okay? Because it doesn't sound like good news at all, right? You know, everlasting good news. Fear God. Judgment. Ah, you know. And let's be honest, that reaction of, ooh, that's not good news, is not unique to Bob. Even in the Seventh-day Adventist church, there's a great deal of fear 
around what this angel has just said, right? And yet, and yet, remember, remember, God has said, God has already said what's coming is good news. And, and if we don't see it as good news, guess who has the privilege of changing their opinion? It's us, right? We, we, if we see it as bad news, we are misunderstanding what God is saying. So let's see if we can unpack this. How, how could this possibly be good news? Well, as it turns out, there are actually at least two ways that the Bible uses the word fear. Okay, number one, the first way that the Bible uses the word fear is stark terror. Okay? We're used to that one. We know what that one's about. In other words, at the end of time, because that's the context that the three angels' messages are given in, at the end of time, those who know what is right but defiantly do otherwise. You know, the Bible sometimes calls this high-handed sin. This is somebody who knows what God wants them to do and just very happily, like, you know, in your face, God, I'm going to do what I want to do, okay? High-handed sin. For those people, at the end of time, when they enter the presence of God, they will experience terror. And again, some of you are struggling and you think, well, where, 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 where's the good news? <laughs> where's the good news in that? Just this. It is indeed bad news for the oppressor, but oh, such good news for the oppressed. Bad news for the oppressor, but oh, such good news for the oppressed. Now, let's dig into this a little bit further here. An, an illustration. Use your imagination with me, please. So let's imagine that you leave the paradise that is Berrien Springs, and you move away inexplicably to, to another town, a small town somewhere out in the middle of nowhere, and uh, let's say you don't have much cash on you, whatnot, you, you, you buy the, the best house you can afford. It's, it's not in the worst neighborhood part of town. It's not, not in the best. And you move in, and pretty soon you hear a rumor that at the far end of the street, there is a man there that preys on children. And you tell your little girl, say, sweetie, don't, don't go down that end of the street. You, you stay here. If you play with your friends, as you make friends, you, you play with them over here. You don't go down that end of the street. Okay. And then one day it happens. She's late coming home from school. You ask the neighbors, they haven't seen her. You go around the neighborhood, the sun is beginning to set, it's getting dark, you're beginning to get desperate, and you think to yourself, please, Lord, no, 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 no. And you go down to the end of the street where he lives, and you go into that house, and you are too late. And you look over on the side of the room, and he's sitting there, smiling, satisfied. She's all yours, he says. And I want you to imagine something with me. I want you to imagine that you go up to that abuser, and you point at him, and you say, and I want you to imagine that this, that this is true. And you say, my God, Jesus Christ, is walking down the road right now to see you. Question. What do you want the man's response to be? Option A. Oh, Jesus, I've heard about him. That's no problem at all. He'll just forgive me. No worries at all. Keeping my eyes open for the next person, for the next girl. No. Option B. Would you like his response instead to be falling down in a dead faint because he realizes that the judge of all the earth is coming to see him? Let's be real clear about something here. It is a sad fact that among many Christians, including inside of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, there is no room for justice. God, God, is, God is such a doormat. You can do whatever you want to do to anybody as long as you want, and he, God's just going to sit there and smile. 
I want you to know, the first angel doesn't agree with that. The first angel actually says exactly the opposite. The first angel makes it very, very clear that justice is coming. The final judgment of all humanity has begun. Justice is coming. The judge of all the earth really is on his way. And notice carefully, it is this kind of judgment, God's perfect judgment, the investigative judgment. We're not talking about human judgment here. I mean, we give it our best shot. We have our court systems and whatnot. And that. But in the, at the end of the day, we're human beings. We're fallible. We make mistakes. God doesn't. Praise the Lord, God doesn't. His judgment is perfect. The, the, the verdict will be perfect. How he executes will be perfect because God is love. God is perfect. The investigative judgment in heaven is the only judgment that can finally bring evil to an end such that it will never rise again. Now follow me carefully here. The first angel refers to this final judgment process with a phrase. It says, the hour of his judgment has come. That is unique in all of Scripture. It doesn't occur anyplace else except here in the first angel. There's other places where it says, you know, the time of his judgment or, or, or the, the, the day of his judgment. Only one place right here, the hour of his judgment. In other words, this is, this is punctilio. This is a point in time that is relatively short compared to the rest of history in which this judgment hour, this final judgment process begins. This specific judgment process began in heaven October 22, 1844. Now I'm going to cut a corner here. This sermon is not about the 2300-day prophecy. We'll save that for another time. But I will say this. Because we know that Jesus came and was baptized when he was and died when he did, and we know when the gospel went to the Gentiles, the first 490 years of the 2300-year prophecy has been fulfilled right on time perfectly. Jesus is the anchor. If we know that we got it right because Jesus confirmed it, we know the ending date is right too, October 22, 1844. That's when the pre-advent investigative judgment began. It has been going on since that time. And so many times, so many times, many Christians are fearful of this idea of the judgment of God. They are fearful of the very idea of the investigative judgment going on right now in heaven. I mean, think to yourselves, well, oh, my name's going to come in the judgment. Oh, will I be able to stand, etc., etc. in there. But did you know, did you know that in light of what Scripture actually says, Every person that can hear my voice right now would not only approve of such a judgment process, but actually crave it. You say, how could that possibly be? At least two reasons. Number one, when thinking of the final judgment, always remember this foundational fact. God is not looking for ways to keep you out of his kingdom, but to get you into his kingdom. Yeah, what is the way into the kingdom? Who is the way into the kingdom? Jesus is, absolutely, he, 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 is, uh, he is our Savior and our Redeemer. Jesus did not die on the cross so that he could then say, nah, 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 boo, boo, found another way to keep you out of the kingdom. No, he didn't do that. Jesus came precisely that we might be saved. You know, John 3.16, probably the most famous Bible text in the world, right? Uh, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son so that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. What's verse 17 say? He did not come into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. That's judgment terminology. And, and Paul picks up on this. Notice this text here. Romans 8, verse 1. Therefore, there is now no condemnation. How much condemnation? No condemnation for those who are what? In Christ Jesus. This is, this is judgment language. The, the, the root word here, this is, very, this is legal terminology that's being used here. Paul knows exactly what he's referring to. This is not random. Paul is referring to the judgment of Jesus Christ about the world. And if you are in Jesus, well, remember what I said last week? The finest hour of the church lies just before us. For those that are in Jesus Christ, this judgment holds no fear for us because we are in Jesus and he will bring us through safely. Amen? Amen. Secondly, notice this. The detailed nature of this judgment process, with all the unfallen universe looking on, you know, this is Daniel chapter 7, this, this, this vision about uh, the Son of Man coming into, not to this earth, but into this judgment scene, being welcomed there by the, by the jury, as it were, angels, etc. 
you know, the detailed nature of this judgment, all the unfallen universe looking on, going through the life records of all who have ever lived, including us, this is absolutely essential to the forever abolition of evil. I mean, can you imagine if a judge today were, were, were it, it, let, let's say that you were falsely accused of something, right? And, and the judge said, hey, you know what? I'm kind of short on time. I've got a golf game coming up here and I need to be there. So I'm just going to look at half the evidence today. And I'll make my judgment based on that. Okay. What would you say about that judge? Okay, get him off the bench. I mean, that, that's not justice at all, right? I want you to see all the evidence because I am innocent of this thing. Well, when we are in Jesus Christ, we are innocent of his blood, correct? I mean, we're, we're covered by his blood. We are no longer held guilty for those things. I want the judgment to see every nook and cranny. I want them to see it all. Because if it's not all seen, you know what the devil will do. He will find a loophole. Well, you didn't look at this. You didn't look at this thing, Jesus, when you went through that judgment process. No, you didn't look over here. I've still got some life left in me. I don't want any life left in the devil when we're all done. I want it to be finished, all done. The detailed nature of the judgment is a gift. It is a blessing. Because only then will evil absolutely be forever abolished, never to rise again. You know, this is why David could say what he said. Psalm chapter 7, verses 6 through 9. David says, Arise, O Lord, in your anger. Rise up against the rage of my enemies. Awake, my God. Decree what? Justice. So notice what he's doing here. He's, he's not just looking for, for you know, a little opinion here and there. He wants justice. Give me something definitive. Let the assembled peoples gather around you. Rule over them from on high. Let the Lord judge the peoples. And just in case David was concerned that we might miss the point of how good this judgment is, notice what he says next. Judge who? Me. Me. He says, judge me, O Lord, please. Judge me next. Make me your next person that you're looking at. Judge me. How come? According to my righteousness, according to my integrity, O Most High, O righteous God who searches hearts, minds and hearts. Here's the reason now why he wants God to judge him. Bring to an end the violence of the wicked and make the righteous secure. The only way that sin will forever be abolished is if God goes through this investigative judgment part. So there are no questions left unanswered for the onlooking universe and so that the devil has no excuse to continue. It's a gift. With the investigative judgment, evil is doomed. It is bad news for the oppressor, but oh, such good news for the oppressed. So let me just ask you this morning, are you an oppressor of other people? You say, Pastor Shane, we're all, we're all good people here. I mean, this is church, right? It would be great if the answer is no, that no one here is oppressing somebody. If you're hearing my voice right now and you are an oppressor of other people, you are using other people, you are manipulating other people, you are, you are soaking up from them for your own ends, your own pleasure, your own advantage. I just want to encourage you to think carefully in light of we've, what we've just read. It is not too late for you to turn. God is a God of compassion, but that compassion will not last forever. There is a process going on right now, and if I read my Bible correctly, we may be nearing the end of that soon. You may or may not have a lifetime to choose for or against Jesus Christ. Jesus is waiting. There's a far better way than you oppressing other people. Come back. He will hold you accountable for your decisions. He loves you, and he wants you back. And secondly, are there some of you listening this morning that are oppressed? Is there somebody that's using you, that's harming you, that's taking advantage of you, taking from you just for their own pleasure, for their own advantage? Is the devil oppressing you these days? If so... Lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. Because the first angel tells me that justice is coming. He loudly proclaims, fear God and give him glory, because the hour of his judgment has come. And the end of evil is just over the horizon. Bad news for the oppressor, but oh, such good news for the oppressed. So that's the first way that the word fear is used in Scripture. 
blessedly, there is a second. And by the way, both of these interpretations of the word fear apply in the first angel's message. Psalm chapter 34, verse 1. Psalm 34, verse 1. It's on page 380 in your red Bible, page 380. Psalm chapter 34, beginning with verse 1. There are a number of places in Scripture in which these two meanings, two, two uses of the word fear are, are utilized. Psalm 34 is, is the tightest that I know of. This, this is the closest proximity that these two senses of the word fear are used. It's incredible to see. Now, Psalm 34, beginning with verse 1. David says, I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. My soul will boast in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me. He delivered me from all my, what? All my fears. Okay, so pause for just a moment. Notice what David is saying here. This this is clearly like, this is terror, right? This kind of stuff. God has delivered him from it. They're all gone. All those fears are gone. Verse 5. Those who look to him, to God, are radiant. Their faces are never covered with shame. This poor man called, and the Lord heard him. He saved him out of all of his troubles. Notice verse 7. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who, what? Fear. Wait a second. I thought we were all done with that. I mean, that's what David just said a few verses earlier. It took all my fears away. And now he says, oh, the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him? And he delivers them, verse 8, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Fear the Lord, you his saints, for those who fear him lack nothing. Wow. Ladies and gentlemen, this sense of fear is clearly not stark terror. No, 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 no. This type of fear is honor and respect. That's what this means. Honor and respect. You can see it very clearly. It's spelled out in the context. God is not looking for us to be in stark terror of him. He doesn't like that. He doesn't want that. But he does want us to fear him in this sense, that we honor and respect him, that we put him first in our list, that we let him lead in our lives. And in exchange, I mean, this is incredible. Little old us. You're, just a, you're, you're one of billions of people that have crawled on the planet and you know, billions more life forms, etc. that God could spend time. And he says to us, If you will honor and respect me, I'll take care of your needs. Wow! All of your spirit. He said that they will lack nothing. That's what David said. That's what, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God, they will lack nothing. If you honor and respect God, put him first place in your life, let him lead you, he will take care of you. Even if you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, he will still be with you. He will bring you through. Even if they take your your, your house and your car and your clothes and your family, even if they take your very life, Jesus says, no problem, I'll bring him back up again. And he will. He will take care of you no matter what happens if you honor and respect him. No wonder David said, blessed are those who fear the Lord. Because those who fear him lack nothing. Is that good news? Yeah, that's good news. All right, we're two for two here in the first part of the first angel's message, and we're not even done yet. Verse 7, please. Revelation chapter 14, beginning with verse 7. It says, He said in a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory, because the hour of his judgment has come. We've looked at that a little bit. Then he finishes with this in the first angel. Worship him who, what? What's that word? Who made, worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. Worship him who made. (sighs) You know, I see my enemy on the wall. As as one of my professors used to say, the Philistines are upon us. In other words, the clock is against me here. So I'm going to, okay, we're we're, going to, there's so much packed into these three angels' messages. If you write something 2,000 years in advance and you intend for this Christmas present to be opened at the end of history, 1844 post, there's all kinds of stuff crammed in there. I don't have time to go into it all, but let me at least notice this. The first angel is going to great lengths to point out one salient thing, that God is our creator. Now, now some Christians look at a statement like that and they go, well, duh, I mean, tell me something else that's more interesting, okay? No, 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 no. I would gently suggest to you that this is one of the most overlooked facts of God's existence in all of, in all of human history. And the reason I say that is because the first angel here is seeking to emphasize God's creatorship, right? 
He's called, there's a call to worship. You know, fear God, give him glory for the hour of his judgment. Worship is a call to worship, and he wants to make sure that we worship the right God. The right God is the creator, no one else. Now, why would he say that? Because to say that God is the creator is the most important thing we can ever say about him. It's more important than saying he's our redeemer because only the creator can be our redeemer. What, what does David say? Create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me. Salvation is an act of creation. Only the creator can save us. And, and so the first angel, at the end of time, all, all the marbles are out there. This is, for, this is for the final game. The angel wants us to know very clearly who it is that we are to worship, no one else. Did you notice also the importance that the seventh-day Sabbath is given in this message? You know, we almost have a direct quotation from the fourth commandment and the Ten Commandments. Some people say, you know what, you Adventists make too much of the seventh-day Sabbath. It's not that big of a deal. Oh, yes, it is. God himself put it there. God put it right here in this first angel's message. It's almost a direct quotation, again, from the fourth commandment of the Big Ten. So the Sabbath here, it takes on profound importance. It reminds us of who God is, that he is our creator. Exactly. And at the end of time, indeed, the Sabbath will be extremely pertinent and important there. We're going to talk more about that in a future installment. We could go on about other references, you know, the, 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 uh, the fountains of water here, a reference to a, a, you know, a literal global flood that took place because of the fountains breaking forth there, and a, a six-day literal creation. There's so much that's packed in here to this first angel's message. But we're going to save that for another time. We are, however, ready to sum up the meaning of the first angel's message. And this is just the best way that I know how to put it down. If you're the kind of person that likes to write notes or put it on your phone, your device, whatever, you might want to write this down. In a nutshell, I'm going to do one of these for the first, the second, and the third angels when the time comes. The nutshell for the first angel, what does the first angel's message mean? I believe it means honor and worship the creator. For justice is coming and time is running out. This is not the first judgment that we're talking about. It's not the middle judgment. It's the final judgment. We may or may not have a lifetime to choose Jesus Christ. Jesus may come before we die. Wouldn't that be great? Wouldn't that be awesome, right? Honor and worship the Creator, for justice is coming and time is running out. And I think I need to visit Bob again. Hey, Bob, it's me again. Yeah, your, your neighbor, Shane. I, I know. One more chance. I mean, you know, just one more chance, please. And Bob's a nice guy, so he's going to let me in. Hey, Bob, listen. Uh, so uh, about that first message that I shared with you last time, I may have jumped the gun a little bit. You know, I, I, I went to church, and I heard a sermon about it, and it might be a little different than maybe what I said. So actually, you know, the first part of, of God's last three messages to you is that if you will honor and respect him, He'll take care of you. I mean, whatever it is that you're facing now, Bob, I don't know all that you're going through, but, but God will take care of you. You know, we put him first in life. I, I, I try to put him first in my life. I can tell you firsthand. I mean, he, he, he provides for me. Even if even there's all kinds of stuff against me, he holds me in his hands. And you know, Bob, when you turn on the TV and, and, and look on your computer and news feeds and stuff, you know, all the carnage and the, the bloodshed and children being... You know, beaten and treated terribly. You know what, right now, God is doing a process that's going to stop all of that forever. It's never going to come back when he's finished. And when, he goes, when he's finished with that, he's going to come back and he's going to make all of these things right. What do you think, Bob? What do you think about that kind of a God? And my guess is Bob likes that a lot. And I hope you do too. Ladies and gentlemen, we live in a world that is filled with oppression. Even if we live in a somewhat peaceful country like this one that's you know, relatively at peace, every day the devil puts us on his list and we are oppressed. And he comes after us with a vengeance like a roaring lion. Justice is coming. The first angel has proclaimed it. And God is looking and he is asking, will the prophetic movement... Do the things that I've asked them to do and say the things that I've asked them to say. 
You know, right now there are millions of people across the planet that have never heard the three angels' messages. They've never heard the good news that's in them. There are people even right here within our sphere of influence, there are thousands of them that have never heard God's good news for this time. I just want to ask you, do you want to be part of a movement that changes that? Do you want to be part of God's final last day movements of bringing this good news to the world and even right here? Can you say amen? Amen. 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 May the Lord find us faithful and joyful with many others with us when he soon returns. indeed your three angels messages are filled with promises you're promising to take care of us you're promising that evil lord will soon come to an end oh how we crave that day lord help us to be instruments in your hands that we might take this good news lord to our neighbors to our friends to our co-workers we pray lord that when you return indeed there will be a mighty multitude by you working through us to bring others to you bless us in this way for we pray it in your name Amen. Amen.